Good morning, Rock, Rock Church. So good to be with you this morning. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Great to be with you this morning. We are going to dive into our Bible study today, but before we do, let's just say a word of prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Um, and I pray that as we dive into it, that you would give us grace to hear and, and to glean from it what you have for us this morning. We love you and praise you. Lead us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you want to open your Bibles to Titus uh, chapter 2, we're going to get there in just a second. Um, But I love what Pastor Rick talked about on Sunday. He talked about how to live a prepared life. Are we prepared? And especially in light of the times and what's going on right now, that's an essential question to ask. And and I, I love that topic also because as I was praying about this Bible study, I felt that same topic highlighted to me. And so what we're going to do today is basically unpack Uh, that topic a little bit more um, and expound upon what Rick talked about on Sunday. And so so you can be in Titus 2. We're going to get to uh, verse 13 in just a moment. But I think looking at this current crisis, I I think it should drive us back to what the Bible says about how to deal with trials. I think this is an important uh, trial run, if you will, um, and and each crisis that we go through needs to be something that we take advantage of and, and learn how to and work out how to respond in the midst of trials. And I think the, the, uh, this type of thing doesn't come around very often. And so I think as the cement is still wet, before the cement dries, so to speak, we need to, to return to Scripture and learn what the Bible actually says about how to, how to respond. Because I think so many times we can just allow ourselves to respond in in whatever way that comes up in the moment. And the way that we respond to this crisis now will be the way that we respond to future crises in the future. And so before that cement dries, let's just dive deep into what the Bible says and establish that for ourselves. Because that's going to be the, it's going to set the precedent for the future. And so to do that, what we're going to do today is dive into what the early church, um, uh, expected in their lives and, and the, the mindset and the, the, uh, the focus of the early church in their lives. Because when we return to that and see how they lived and what they expected and how they walked through trials, that's going to empower us to thrive rather than just survive in the midst of trials. So let's do that. Ch- Titus 2, um, 11 to 13, Paul says, the grace of God that, that, uh, gives salvation has been revealed to all people, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for, and this is verse 13, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's the first point today is that in the early church, they focused on something called the blessed hope. And the blessed hope, just like we read in Titus 2 just now, is the the coming of Jesus. And so every day, that's what drove them forward. That's what gave them the boldness to do what they did, to preach the gospel, to to endure trials, to endure persecution, and and even suffering without giving up hope. Why? Because their their hope wasn't in the things that were going on around them. They, They lifted their eyes higher than the trials, and they focused their attention on the return of Jesus. And that's what gave them focus in their lives. That's what gave them the the courage to press forward like nothing else. And I can tell you even from my own life, as I started diving deeper into this focus on the return of Jesus, that is something that focused me like never before to where I woke up every day with with uh, an awareness that Jesus is returning and I wanted to live every moment that I could possibly live in preparation for his return. And so I I think that's so important and essential when we're looking at trials is to keep that blessed hope, that attention focused on Jesus's return. Because I I think it's easy for us to live life in the midst of a vacuum. Meaning, I think it's easy for us to feel like things are gonna continue on the way that they've always been. Nothing's ever gonna really change and everything just kind of happens in cycles and and nothing's gonna change. Maybe you've heard people talk like that. Like, oh, it's just all hype. Nothing's going to really ever change. And, and there's actually a verse that speaks to that in 2 Peter 3, verse 4. It says this, it says, in the end times, people will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Again, maybe we've heard people talk like that. Oh, Jesus is not coming back. There's going to be thousands of years probably before that happens. And, and the result of that uh, lack of, of awareness and that, that uh, complacency is it, it makes us apathetic. 
It makes us apathetic to the times in which we live. It, it doesn't empower us to live an intentional lifestyle. In fact, it actually makes us complacent. And when we're apathetic and complacent, it actually makes us vulnerable to being unprepared when crisis comes. Um, <clears throat> I think of the, the same logic as bringing it into the realm of our, our own personal health. If I were to say, well, I've never had a heart attack before, so therefore I'm never going to have a heart attack. What would that do to my habits? What would that do to my lifestyle? Would it empower me to live a healthy life? Would it empower me to, to eat healthier and to exercise? No, it would, it would just embolden me in my own uh, uh, unhealthy habits of eating whatever I wanted to. Why? Because I've never had that crisis of a, a, a physical ailment before. And that sets me on the fast track to, to having problems in the future. And the same thing happens when we're apathetic to the return of Jesus and the events leading up to that return and the, the trials that are promised to come. If we're not aware of that, we can't live in light of it. If we're not aware of it, we can't live an intentional lifestyle preparing ourselves for the future trials in our lives, but also those end time trials that are coming before the Lord returns. And so we need to be aware, we need to be prepared for his coming. I think when we live an apathetic lifestyle disconnected from the reality of Jesus coming back, it, it causes us in the midst of trials, it, it causes us to be shaken. It causes us to have fear in our hearts. It causes us to start doubting God's goodness in our lives. And, and aside from even doubting his goodness, I think some of us could even start doubting his existence. So all these things can happen if we're not preparing ourselves for trials. In Haggai, I, I quoted this verse a couple weeks ago in our roundtable discussion, but Haggai chapter 2 verse 6, this is a prophecy about the end, and it says this, it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, once more I will shake heaven and earth, sea and dry land. So there's a day coming when God promises to shake everything that can be shaken. And why is he going to do that? Well, I think at, at the end, he, he's out for wholehearted love from his people. He's, he's not looking for half-hearted love. And so when he shakes everything that can be shaken, he's going to remove the gray area where people li live one foot in the world and one foot in God. He's going to tear down the fence that people sit on where, where they're kind of dabbling in the world and kind of loving God, but not too much. He's going to remove that and say, no, I want you to love me with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And so that's why he's going to shake everything to wake people up, to come out of that complacent place to where they can choose to love him with all of their hearts because he's after that wholehearted bride at the end of the age. And so the reality is, though, is that when we, when we cling to the things that are shakable, meaning if we're clinging to <clears throat> how physically prepared we are right now in a current crisis, if we're clinging to the hope that this all this will be over by May 1st. If we're clinging to the hope that, that uh, we won't get sick in this season, whatever, whatever we're clinging to that are, are not bad in, of the, in and of themselves. But if we're clinging to and placing our hope in those things, when those things that we can't control are, are shaken, or in other words, they don't come to pass the way that we hoped, we're going to be shaken too. Whatever you cling to that, that's shaking, you're going to shake also, right? But if we're clinging to the one that's unshakable, that's a rock, Malachi says that the, I'm the Lord, I do not change. So when we're clinging to the unchangeable God, even though everything shakes around us, we'll remain unshakable. But we have to prepare now and know how to respond to trials now to be that unshakable person in future trials and in the end of the age. <clears throat> so this is a really important thing that we need to understand Final thing on this, and then we'll talk about some of the lifestyle of, of preparedness and how to live a prepared lifestyle. But final point is this, you can turn to 1 Peter 4, 1 Peter 4 verse 1, we're going to get there in a moment. But there's a theme throughout scripture, and this isn't a popular theme, especially in the Western world, but there's a theme throughout scripture of God not exempting his people from trials. There's a theme throughout scripture of God not exempting his people from going through trials and tribulations and sufferings. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. And so that's something that we need to understand and, and equip our brains with and equip our hearts with so that we can wrestle through that in our prayer times of, okay, Lord, why, why are you allowing me to go through this trial? What, what does your word say about trials? What, Explain to me how you're with me in the midst of those, those trials and those tribulations and how you are still good. And it's working out those things in our hearts ahead of time. 
so that when the trials come, we're not surprised by them. We're not shaken by them. We're not shocked, but we, we've taken the time to, to, to cultivate our hearts before the Lord to where when those things come, we're like, yeah, I, I expect trials in my life, but I know that God's with me. He's going to preserve me in the midst of it. He's going to pr promote me in the midst of trials like he did with Daniel in Babylon, like Joseph in Egypt. They, they, they went through these difficult circumstances, but they trusted in the living God. And what did he do? He blessed them. He preserved them, even in the midst of suffering, and they did suffer. But he actually elevated them to a place of authority to where they had the ability to speak into other people in those times and be, be pillars of strength in the midst of those times. So looking at First, uh, First Peter 4, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. Isn't that an interesting passage? So since Jesus suffered, he, uh, Peter's calling the church to arm ourselves with that same mind. Meaning that when we set in our hearts, yes, okay, I am going to go through trials in my life. It's actually equipping us with weapons that we need to bring us to the other side of the trials without being destroyed by them. Isn't that powerful? So we need to prepare ourselves by, by arming ourselves with that mind that, yes, we'll go through it. But yes, he's going to be with us, empowering us, promoting us, and preserving us, and using us as lighthouses in the midst of a very dark time. But we have to prepare ahead of time. So what do we, what do, we do and how do we live uh, to live a prepared life. Well, I think we need to work this muscle now um, of, of preparedness and of, of enduring trials, like I mentioned earlier. And I like the picture of this. Picture you're, you're, you're walking around outside and it's a sunny day, but there's some clouds. There's patches of clouds all around. So it's sunny, but periodically what begins to happen as the wind blows, the clouds kind of cover the sun for a moment, don't they? And what happens? There's darkness in the land for a few minutes and then the cloud passes by the sun and then it's bright again. And that's exactly like the momentary trials that we deal with in this life. They're like those momentary clouds that pass by the sun. But the end time trials and the trials that are going to come before the, the coming of the Lord are like the nighttime, the midnight, like Rick talked about in his sermon of the, the parable of the foolish and the wise virgins. When, when the bridegroom comes, there's a midnight cry, behold, the bridegroom's coming, go out to meet him, right? And so how we respond in the midst of the clouds is setting us up to respond in that same way in the midnight of human history before the Lord returns. And so again, we need to work the, the muscle of responding to trials in the midst of those, those, those uh, small trials even though they're significant, so that we're prepared to not be offended, like Matthew 24 talks about in the end times, that there's going to be much uh, offense and many uh, people's hearts growing cold before the Lord returns. So we, we don't want to be those people. I believe that we're not going to be. But again, we have to work that muscle now in order to not be that person that falls away and that loses their, their fire for the Lord in the midst of difficulty. And I think one of the best people to look at to model our lives after is John the Baptist. Because how, how John, John's context is similar to the context of the church at the end of the age. And again, I'm not saying that we're in the, the final days leading up to the return of Christ. I don't believe that this is technically the, the last. And just like John, John prepared himself because he knew the Messiah was coming. So he lived, many believe that he lived out in the desert with a community called the Essenes, the Essenes. And at this point, I, I, I wanna just popped into my mind to remind you that if you have questions about these things, I wanna encourage you to start typing those out now so that we can get to them during this video. Um, you can comment in the chat box to the right of the, uh, the YouTube video um, or email them to media at the .com. So again, any questions, please start sending those now um, so that we can answer some of those this morning. But when you look at John, many believe that he was a part of a, uh, a community called the Essenes. And this was a community that lived out in the deserts and they gave themselves to a lifestyle of prayer, of fasting, of studying the scriptures diligently, of living in community. But the interesting thing about all this is that they also lived with an expectation that the end times were coming and they wanted to be prepared to meet the Messiah. And so John lived inside of this community for decades and decades to prepare for Jesus coming on the scene. And he lived a lifestyle of repentance. And when he came on the scene, that was actually what he preached to the people. Repent, get right with God because the Messiah is coming. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I believe that we need to model our lives anticipating the second coming of that same Messiah, Jesus Christ, after John the Baptist. Living an intentional life of, of, of two different aspects. Because when you look at John the Baptist, and I, again, I don't have time to go through all the verses now, 
about John the Baptist, but when you look at his lifestyle, there were two components to his lifestyle, intimacy and urgency. Intimacy with God and urgency in preparing for, for the last days and the return of Jesus. And when you look at the intima intimacy component, John considered himself a friend of the bridegroom. A friend of the bridegroom. What does that mean? Well, he considered Jesus to be the bridegroom, but he actually identified himself as the friend of the bridegroom who rejoices to hear his voice. See, John spent years in the wilderness praying and seeking God and talking to God and cultivating that friendship with God. To where when Jesus came on the scene, he felt like he, he knew him. He, was, he, he loved him. He was loyal to him. And he was unshakable. But then there's that second aspect of urgency to where, like we talked about, John lived an intentional, focused life. And again, I, I, I want to encourage you just to, to, to focus on some of those verses and focus on that reality of the Lord coming back, that blessed hope. Because when we do, it focuses you like never before. You wake up every morning with a new sense of purpose that life isn't just going on in some, into some nebulous vacuum. No, all of human history is moving toward a crescendo called the return of Jesus when he's going to make every wrong thing right and release his justice into every situation. And we need to be prepared for that. And that's that second component of, of living a life of intentional preparation like, like John lived. And so <clears throat> what does that look like? It looks like prayer. It looks like reading our Bibles. It looks like engaging in worship intentionally every single day. And if we do that, that's how we're going to have strength to make it through the midnight of human history, but also make it through those little clouds that pass by the sun in our current trials. And so um, if there's any questions, you can send those in. I'm going to check um, that. But um, final verse, and then we'll, we'll close with a challenge and then, uh, and then pray. Uh, Romans 5. You can turn to Romans 5, 3 through 5. Paul's talking about dealing with trials, and I'll, uh, I end with this verse because it's such a clear picture of, of what trials can be for our hearts to grow us in friendship with God. He says, not only that, but we also rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. So Paul's saying basically when we go through trials in this life, we have two options. We can push away from God or we can press into him in the midst of the trials. And if, as we lean into Jesus in the midst of the pressure that we face in life, pressure is how those, those diamonds are made. And what are those diamonds in our hearts? So it's the diamonds of friendship with God. It's that oil of intimacy like the, the parable of the virgins that we can't get from somebody else, right? We have to cultivate it on our own. And as we choose to lean into Jesus in the midst of trials, that's what begins to happen. Those diamonds of, of friendship and intimacy with God get, get formed inside of our hearts. And what, is that, what does that uh, translate into? Well, the tribulation produces perseverance, but the perseverance produces character. And that's that other aspect of those diamonds, so to speak, in our hearts is becoming like Jesus. And so when we lean into him in friendship, when we lean into him in the midst of pain and suffering rather than pushing away from him, you will cultivate things in your hearts that, that can't be cultivated outside of that pressure. And so I want to encourage you to take advantage of this season now to prepare ourselves for future trials, but also now to, to dive deeper and to catapult you farther in your relationship with God that you can go when everything's fine and when everything's at peace. Amen. So I want to end with a challenge this morning. <clears throat> for your quiet times this week. I want to encourage you to get out a journal at some point today when you're spending your time with the Lord. And I want, to, I want you to, to ask the Lord this question. Lord, how have I responded in my heart to this current trial? How have I responded in my heart to this current trial? And I don't want you to be afraid to ask God that because he's not going to shame you. The Lord says that he's slow to anger. He's so patient. He's so kind and compassionate with us. But I want us to ask him that question, Lord, how have I done responding in my heart? Has there been indifference? Has there been fear? Have I given into anxiety and a frantic mode? Have I gotten into that? And just let him give you impressions in your heart. Let him speak to your heart and write down in your journal whatever you feel like he said to you. And then I want to, I, I want to encourage you to ask him for strength, for grace, to respond by leaning into him in the, in the midst of this trial rather than pushing away from him. Again, these, these trials will prepare us and lay that foundation while the cement is wet for the days ahead. So I want to pray for us. And then again, if you have any questions, you can email media at the and I'll, I'll reach out to you and answer those questions for you. So let's pray. Father, we love you. 
We thank you for your word and for how you tell us that we can prepare for the days of your return, but also in the current crises that we deal with in our lives. Lord, I pray for those who are, are dealing with fear right now. I pray that you would calm the storms within them. Lord, that you would give us grace to lean into you rather than pushing away from you. And that we would learn from John the Baptist, Lord, that, that we would have those two pillars of intimacy and urgency every day of our lives, that we would lean into you as a friend, but that we would also give ourselves to intentional preparation and setting our eyes on that blessed hope of Jesus returning. And we want to be ready, Jesus. We want to be ready to meet you. So we love you. We pray that you would bless us as we ask you this question this week and that you would help us to respond uh, by running into your heart in the midst of this trial. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for tuning in this morning. Have a great rest of the week and really dive into the Lord and in his presence this week. Thank you.